And that allows uh, a measure of endemism over the millennia in a lot of the cacti that are found there. They're often very substrate specific, so they are found in quartz and limestone often, restricted to those types of habitats, which can be part of the problem in Peru or in Bolivia, excuse me, I just did a Peru talk a couple of weeks ago. Um, uh, but in Brazil, they're poorly known, and because of often their restriction to specific habitats, their ongoing human impact to the natural habitat is greatly increased. They're very small populations often that are impacted by very localized type of human impact, and that includes farming, but in the drier communities, it includes a lot of mining activities. As I indicated, a lot of these are found in quartz and limestone, and for miners, they'll perk up their ears whenever they hear that. So a lot of these populations are extremely endangered uh, because of the mining activities in Brazil. And um, right now, they, the, the political situation in Brazil for the past several years and currently uh, is not conducive to conservation, let's put it that way. But the nicest thing, the interesting thing for me with uh, Brazilians is they're widely appreciated for many of their relatively unique modes of flowering. And that primary mode of flowering that most people would hear about um, that are um, in relation to Brazilian species is called the cephalium, or plural is cephalia, the Latin for head, right? Um, many of you probably know cacti are, that do have cephalia that are not Brazilian because it is not unique to Brazil, Brazilian cacti. It is also found in other groups of cacti. Uh, Andean cacti have them, the genus genera like Espostoa and Vatricania, but also in Central America with some of the Pelosocereus, uh, the blue candle type of species. But in Brazil, cephalia, the development of cephalia reaches its peak. And not only does it reach its peak, but Brazilian cacti tend to do it in a different way than many of the other cacti that you may be familiar with, with cephalia. So I'm going to start, I'm going to, as I go through um, some of the cacti that I show you, I'm going to mention when we're seeing cephalia and, and point out the different differences with some of these Brazilian groups of cacti. And a cephalium is a part, a development with it on the cactus to maximize reproduction or flowering with a minimum of effort because in order to grow, it takes a lot of effort, right? And in a regular cactus, seen here like this mammillaria, there's one growing point right in the middle, and it grows down, right? So the aerials, those tuberculies, um, with that are those pointed conical uh, morphological characters on most cacti, and that the spines come from are called aerials. Well, not only do the spines come out the aerials, but the flowers are also coming out of the aerials. And it's interesting to note that with very few exceptions, there's only two, <clears throat> primarily two genera that um, don't follow this rule. But as the rule, an aerial, aerial can flower just once. And that's the critical component. Once an aerial flowers, it's done. And the cactus, in order to flower more, has to do what? They have to grow more. And of course, growing takes energy. Production of, of aerials takes energy and takes resources. And of course, in poor habitats, in dry habitats, hot habitats, you're trying to conserve your energy as much, as much as possible. So in mammillaria, for example, most of them, most of the aerials that flower don't flower their first year. So they grow from the middle, right? And they usually flower their second or third year. And all the aerials of the same age tend to flower at the same time. And that's how you get the ring, right? So you have a, a ring of aerials surrounding the growing point because the flowers are actually, uh, or the flowers are coming from aerials that are all the same age. Whereas some cacti, I like this Thelocactus hastifer, the newest aerials flower. And so that's why you're seeing flowers that only occur at the tips or the growing point of cacti, okay? So despite where the flowers appear, once that aerial flowers, it's done and it will never flower again. Another consideration that cacti in these types of habitats have to contend with is when you do produce a flower and you do produce seed and fruit, it takes a lot of energy. So you want to conserve that fruit until it's ready to actually be distributed, right? And so you don't want that nasty thrasher or the rats or anything to, to grab that fruit before it's ready, before the seed's actually viable. And so some cacti, 
like this Mammillaria luvethii, will actually hide the fruit within the body of the cactus. Okay, and a matter of fact, some of the members of this group, they hide it so long that the parent cactus actually has to die before the actual seed is, is released. That's how, how much they're, they're conserving that energy that they put into that next generation, okay? So cephalia also provide a measure of protection to the developing fruit. And a cephalia is basically cacti trying to basically cheat the system. So how about if I grow more aerials but not spend as much energy as normal. A lot of the energy in an aerial goes to producing tissue that can uh, photosynthesize. It's the green part of the cactus, right? They need that to eat, right? They need that to live, to breathe, right? But there's a certain point that a cactus can get to, okay, I'm big enough now, I've got enough growing tissue where you can actually start converting some of your growth to only aerials and you don't have to worry about the chlorophyll anymore. And so you don't have to worry about the, those parts. So what you do is you just grow, grow aerials that can flower and you don't have to have space between them because the sun doesn't need to get there. So you grow them really, really close together. And to help protect those aerials because those are the flowering aerials, you tend to, the spines tend to get form hair instead of spines to kind of cover up the developing fruits and seed. And so when you see the hairy side of a cactus, that's usually indicative of a cephalium. And that's what we're gonna see in some of these cacti. So to review, the three primary concerns that cacti will always have when reproduction is more aerials means more reproduction. You gotta eat, so you've gotta have photosynthetic tissue. So you have to grow at least as much as you need for the life and for your entire life of that photosynthetic tissue. Plus, I've got to protect myself and the seed. So I've got to have spines to protect my body, and I can have things like hair to protect the seeds and the fruit before uh, they're viable. So, oh, the tales they tell. Whenever you, most people read about Brazilians and whether or not they grow in Arizona, a lot of what you read doesn't match what we actually experience, okay? So I've actually spent almost the entire 20 years that I've been in Arizona pushing the boundaries and I loved the Brazilians so much, I wanted to grow them. And so I've actually had some measure of success um, growing them and have been able to get around the things you have to worry about when you grow Brazilians in Arizona. The primary one is temperature, right? Brazilians, they grow in very hot environments, but there's pretty much no hotter environment that's a Sonoran desert at times, right? So it's a little excessive here. And on top of, it's not just the hot, but it's the sun and the UV is what does the damage. And it increases the temperature as well. So there's the heat problem that you have with trying to grow Brazilians. And there's a cold problem. Uh, if anybody's read about the books that talk about growing Brazilian type of cacti in, in cultivation, they always talk about uh, the famous saying is 50 degrees Fahrenheit. Everything has to stay above 50, degree, 50 degrees Fahrenheit. Can't get below there or else you can't survive. And as you know, in the, in the valley, not only are we really hot, but we actually get pretty cold depending on where you are in the valley. Um, I'm out in Chandler, Southeast Chandler, so I'm in a pretty warm area. And um, in normal years, I experience free, below freezing temperatures fairly regularly during the winter. Of course, the last five years, which we've had almost no winters to speak of, I've still flirted with the freezing temperatures. So that's quite a bit colder than 50 degrees is what a lot of published, uh, material says. And then you'll hear, also hear a lot of information about moisture, a lot of warnings about moisture. You need very well draining mix. You can't keep the roots wet. The, wet, the, wet, the wetness is going to cause root sensitivity in a lot of these cacti and they're going to they're gonna lose their roots. You hear that all the time when it comes to a lot of the Brazilian cacti I'm going to show you. Well, Arizona ain't no Brazil. However, these are the, some of the things in the, in the and the challenges that I've actually overcome by doing specific things. With regards to temperature, absolutely most of them need some protection from that afternoon sun. We say that about almost all the cacti out there, right? Uh, but it's definitely the case. Very few in my experience of the Brazilians tend to be able to handle full sun. They do need some protection, but I have not protected any of my plants below uh, above 35 degrees. So this 50 degree thing, that you see in a lot of the literature is simply not true in our type of habitat. Keep in mind, a lot of the literature you read comes out of Europe, often out of England, where they have very damp, humid, wet winters. 
And so that's a big critical component. We don't have that. We have very dry winters. And so that helps us enormously when it actually um, comes to temperature, it allows us to uh, cacti to survive at colder temperatures without that moisture. Drainage. Most of the documentation you'll see is drainage, drainage, drainage. You need really, really good drainage. Well, you really do when you're growing your plants in pots, you need excellent drainage. So they do need a bit more water uh, throughout the year, including the summer, they tend not to go dormant. The uh, most active growing season for most of my Brazilians is late summer and early fall into the early winter sometimes. So they have a little bit of a different growing period. So they do need water at times when you, you might think that your Sonoran desert plants are actually dormant and not getting um, water. But I found in, you, in the ground, and, and this is, applies not just to Brazilians, but I don't want as much drainage in the ground. And that is because of the cooling effect that moisture can have on roots to get them through our hottest temperatures. And it's particularly important, I think, in uh, the Brazilians to allow uh, some capacity to retain water uh, in the roots when you're planting them in the ground. Light. This is the most difficult thing. Brazilians love, 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 love light, but they hate, 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 hate Arizona sun. Anytime after May, usually, uh, all the way up through September. So that's the biggest challenge is how do I balance the amount of light with the damaging rays from the sun in Arizona when I'm deciding where to go with these? In a, in a, in a shade house or a greenhouse, you may have a little bit more control, but I grow most of my plants in the ground. And so this has been a challenge for me. I end up planting things in probably a little more shade than they would like. The result is over the years, they tend to flower less than they would otherwise if they were in uh, more light situations. But I'm willing to sacrifice that because otherwise I have to have a shade house, which I don't have in my yard. So, um, And the last thing I put in here, wind protection for a lot of these columnars, they, there's a lot of very tall columnars in Brazil and ones that I do grow. And in Brazil, they don't have monsoon season. So a lot of these plants don't grow where they have really torrential winds. And so just to be on the safe side, a lot of my rare Brazilians that are tall, I've actually stake up, um, particularly in the monsoon season, to make sure that the wind doesn't damage them. So those are the considerations you need. Um, for me, the best locations are beneath small leaf semi-deciduous trees. I have a Palo Brea, which is perfect for growing Brazilians underneath the Palo Brea. Um, you only have to deal with litter this time of year when the the yellow flowers from the Palo Brea are, tend to be falling, but it's a very short period of time where you have to worry about litter, but they're, uh, the leaves are small enough that it lets a lot of light in, but not too much. So that's really an ideal type of tree. And here's an example of a Brazilian, Brazilian Pylososarius growing under one of the trees. It actually, actually happens to be growing under a Brachychiton, which is a horrible tree to never use a Brachychiton, but um, it, is, it is providing sufficient protection from the UV that it does like that area. East or west of shade providers, whether they be walls, tall bushes, cacti, if it is a wall, make sure that you're at least two feet from the reflective surface if you're facing the full sun. Um, so you can see here, I've got a couple of tall kilometers from Brazil and they're located at least two feet from the retaining wall and they do perfectly fine there. In the winter, that retaining wall actually helps because it does increase the ambient temperature near the wall. Full sun. There are a couple of species that I have been able to manage to grow in full sun with a lot of protection and good water supply almost year round. Um, most of those are the Pelosocereus uh, genus. And there's an example of a little Pelosocereus that I planted in full sun. So here is the, an example of my favorite yard for the Brazilians. I actually call these my Brazilian gardens. Uh, this is on the east side of my house. So there's a strip of land and I've, I've uh, planted raised uh, beds. I've, I've added fill dirt mixed with granite. So I figure most of these cacti in Brazil grow in granite or quartz substrates. And so I actually mix granite in the, in the dirt uh, that I make these mounds with uh, to increase drainage. So uh, they do very well here. In those pictures, I mean, the vast majority of the plants are 
Brazilian. Of course, there are some things in here that you'll notice aren't Brazilian. Agaves don't occur in Brazil. I'm an agave grower. This is a Fucaria leonale. I grow Fucarias. Um, so other things do like that area as well, but vast majority of the plants in, these, in this garden are the uh, Brazilian species. So now the good stuff. So now I'm gonna show you a whole bunch of plants that I do currently grow in my garden, um, most of which have flowered. Uh, there's many, many, many more that I'm not picturing, some of which have flowered, some of which have not flowered. So um, keep that in mind um, that this is not the limit of what you can grow in Arizona. There's an enormous number of species you can grow. And this is Wobelmania pectinifera, um, growing in my garden. Uh, has not flowered for me yet, but I'm uh, crossing my fingers. One of the most unique and interesting genera that is endemic to Brazil is the genus Orojodoa. Uh, some of you, and I know Nancy grows some, um, some of you may grow these already. Uh, they do extremely well in the ground. Uh, they do like it here, but they're one of the most unique of the cacti because they do get a cephalia, what I was talking about, this, this way of cheating and getting around the growth, but they do it in a very different way than any other genus out there, well, except for one, which is sometimes left in it. We'll talk about that later. Um, so what they'll do is they grow in a slim columnar fashion like this, and then they'll stop growing the green growth, right? The, 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 the growth that's uh, photosynthetic, and all of a sudden the tissues will convert to growing just a cephalium. So what it's doing is it's growing aerials extremely close together without photosynthetic tissue, they're not green at all, and they get a lot of hair and uh, furry spines associated with them. And this is where the flowers are developing inside that cephalium, and then they stick out of the cephalium. And if you had to guess, uh, if we were all in the same room, I'd ask you to raise your hand if you think that hummingbirds like these, right? Um, Brazil has lots of hummingbirds, so they have a lot of hummingbird pollinated plants. And sure enough, Arohadoa is a very typically hummingbird pollinated plant. So they have a lot of these red tubular flowers that you'll see. So this is Arohadoa dene, but all the Arohadoa have that same form. So here's Arohadoa multiflora. So the flowers are a little different, but you'll see here's the morphological uh, photosynthetic growth, and then it stopped. It converted to cephalium growth. And it grew for a whole season, these, the cephalium. It flowered from that cephalium. Then after that flowering season was over, and this is what's unique about Arohodoa, it shut down the uh, growth of cephalic tissue and can reconvert it back to growing regular tissue. And then the next growing season, it grew as a regular plant. Then when it was flowering season, it shut down that type of growth. The tissues converted completely over to growing just a cephalium with the fur and the hair and the flowers coming out. And it does that for the whole season. And then after that flowering season's over, it shuts down the cephalic growth again, and it keeps growing these segments. So you'll see Arohodoa have these segments associated with them. Now, the interesting thing is, is after it, it could reconverts back to morphological tissue after this, what we call a cephalic ring, that doesn't mean that ring is done flowering. That ring can still flower. And so you will often find flowers both at the tips and coming out of the sides from those cephalic rings in these Arohodoa. It's a fascinating genus. It's the only genus that does cephalium phalia like this. And it's one of my favorites and they do really well here. Some of them don't start a cephalic ring until they're quite a bit taller. So this is like a three foot tall Arohodoa penicillata. And then it started growing the cephalic ring and they were grew at the same time. Here's the flowers are coming out. A lot of uh, people that actually grow this don't realize uh, that they need to stay up late to see them really truly open. They actually open at night. And here on the right side is actually what they look like when they're fully open. So you'll see a lot of pictures on the internet of these things in the daytime saying, here's the flower. Well, those are closed buds. This is what they look like when they're open. And you'll notice it's dark, it's nighttime. It's a nighttime photo that I took. One of my favorite Arohodo is gorgeous plant. And here's a really great illustration of what I was talking about. Here's an old cephalic ring from the previous season, still flowering. And here's the current flowering season up here and it's flowering and they'll flower at the same time. And here's a picture of one of the, my plants, the Horstiana. So here it's growing from this cephalic ring over here, but there's a cephalic ring there. This season was a very short 
non-blooming season, so the, the segment's small. There's another ring, there's another ring here, there's another ring here. So you'll see, you'll see these segments. And at the end of those segments is used, uh, was originally the tip of the plant that was flowering, it's a phallic ring. And they still flower from those rings. Here's those dark ones, the flowers turn black after they're done, if they're not pollinated. So you can see spent flowers there, but you can also see spent flowers here on the previous season. So Arohodoa, very unique, endemic to Brazil, classic Brazilian uh, uh, species uh, that you'll see. So you kind of get the idea with Arohodoa. They all grow the same way. The difference, as you'll see, is basically in the flowers, sometimes minor, sometimes major variations in the flowers, but they're all along the same theme. So thin, tubular, uh, wonderful for hummingbirds. So Arohodoa nana is just a little more yellow, not as much red. Thenuissima has the petals are a little more rounded, they're not pointed. And then Rhodanthus uh, subspecies aurea spinus, another one that I grow, um, has very golden brown spines. Arthrocereus is another genus that's entirely endemic to Brazil. Uh, they do not get a cephalium, but they do grow in segments. Uh, we're not sure why they grow in segments, but they just grow in segments like this. The species does, uh, the Mazioi, and there's some debate as to whether Demanzio is an appropriate name. You might see other names associated with this guy, but um, taxonomy will be another talk. <laughs> so, uh, but they have gorgeous nocturnal flowers. They are moth pollinated, so they have very long tubes and open at night. And they're usually very, very fragrant. Uh, there's only one species in the genus Arthrocereus that is not a, a completely white flower. And that is Arthrocereus rondonianus, which is also the most common species. Um, it's a golden, uh, spined uh, plant, so it's really gorgeous. You can see one of my plants. I've got five of these plants. They're all growing in ground. Um, and lucky me, they have only flowered when I have not been home. Um, not bitter at all, but Jacob has been on flower patrol, so he was able to get a, a photo of my flower. So you can see how distinctive the flower is in this Arthur series. It's not a pure white flower. It does tend to open in the evening, but it does stay open through half the next day. Um, and uh, it's got that nice purple, bright purple petals in the middle and the tepals around them are white. So beautiful species to grow. There's several other different Arthrocereus that, um, that are known, but they're extremely rare in cultivation. I have a couple of them, most of them are growing from seed right now uh, and they haven't flowered. Brazil Cereus baeacanthus is another endemic genus to Brazil. Obviously it's called Brazil Cereus, right? Great name. And, I'm growing a couple of clones of this species. Um, unfortunately, mine did uh, start flowering for the first time uh, last month and it developed for about two weeks and then the bud aborted, so crash. But um, so what I've got is I've got a, a picture of the flowers of Michael Pillay. Uh, his plant flowered this year. So these are pictures from his plant. Michael Pillay is Prickly Prospects uh, Nursery. Um, he also grows a lot of these rare Brazilians. And so we often trade pollen and constant communication uh, trying to propagate these interesting Brazilians. But as you can see, it's done very well on that east side yard. Uh, it was just a small thing when I planted it in the ground and it's now uh, a, a beautiful specimen. And um, they're interested in flowering now, but not quite all the way there. Ciposarius is another uh, genus that you probably have heard of, probably the one on the left. Ciposarius bradii is the one that's regularly available because it is, uh, depending on who you talk to, tends to be one of the most colorful or popular of them because of that blue color. Any blue kind of cactus is often quite popular. And they have these dark brownish spines in some clones. So they do, uh, they are very attractive. However, there are other species in the genus like the Ciposarius monensis, harder to come by. I do have a couple of them. Um, the really unique thing about Ciposarius, though, is that when they start flowering, the flower bud, as well as the fruit that results from pollination, are a deep cobalt blue on all the members of this genus. So they're absolutely gorgeous. They're actually known for their flower buds and their fruits more than the flowers. The flowers themselves are kind of boring. Um, they look very much like a Palosocereus flower. They're nocturnal, uh, typically batten uh, moth pollinated. Uh, so they tend to be white, have white petals, but the outer tepals are this deep, deep blue. Mine have not flowered yet, so I don't have pictures of those, unfortunately. Another really spectacular genus that I really love is Coleocephalus aureus, um, also endemic to, Peru, to Brazil. I keep saying Peru. Um, 
maybe it's because I went to eat Peruvian last night. So, uh, but yeah, anyhow, Brazil, endemic to Brazil, there's quite a few species, um, Coleocephalus aureus aureus and Coleocephalus aureus purpureus are the two smaller species that flower when they're smaller. So they tend to be more popular. Uh, Coleocephalus aureus aureus is really the only one that's regularly found in cultivation, but it does have spectacular flowers. These are really a neon green color and the, the photograph actually doesn't do them justice. And this is a genus that does get a cephalium, but they're, you, they're instead of doing a, a cephalium at the tip and forming a, a, a tip or a ring of cephalic tissue, it gets it on one side. They start in the middle and the, the cephalium, as the plant grows, most of the plant grows regular on one side, but the other side is cephalic tissue. And so it's get this furry area that's growing down the side. And you can see this starting with this plant. This plant was only maybe six inches tall at the time. So they do grow at a, quite a bit of smaller size. So they're a very good one to have in uh, cultivation because uh, you'll definitely see them flower um, in a matter of years if you get a decent size. Um, but as you can see, it also gets a spinier area to protect the fruit and the flowers as it's developing to make sure that um, their energy isn't wasted. As you could probably guess, Coleocephalus aureus purpureus has purple flowers. Um, mine has not flowered yet. I've got several different clones now. I'm hoping to get flowers soon. It is one of the most endangered cacti in Brazil. One of its main populations um, uh, was on some quartz that was going to be mined. And so a conservation group in Brazil, actually, one of the first time they tried to do this, they went and they took the plants out on, of the property, um, dug them up, which digging in quartz and rock is actually really tough, very, very tough. So they did the best they could, and they transplanted them to um, another site a couple of hills away outside of that property that got mined. That, 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 plot, that plot got completely destroyed, so it is no longer there, so the plants would have died anyhow. Uh, they've had varying success with the transplant but you know you, you know at least they try they've got to try something with a lot of the destruction that's happening there so this is a really good one to have in cultivation to for the exceedo um, propagation to make sure that this is a species that actually continues to thrive other members of the genus you might see available coleocephalus aureus guebelianus um, actually gets pretty big before it starts forming a cephalium and flowering um, but it is grown for its spinage. Uh, the spines are really strong, stout spines, as you can see from this specimen. Um, and those are very attractive to a lot of people. And then another one that um, the ISI, uh, the Huntington ISI, International Succulent Inter Introductions, introduced, I think it was either last year or the previous year, um, they introduced a Coleocephalus aries pluricostatus. So a mini, mini ribbed, what pluricostatus means. And so there's two, this is actually one of the ones from the ISI introduction. This is another one I had on my own. Uh, that's been in the ground a little bit longer that are growing. And then this is Coleocephalus aureus fluminensis. So this will give you an idea of what these look like when they get mature. Um, this is actually not in my yard, as you could probably tell. I actually um, was working with John Traeger at the Huntington last weekend. And uh, when we were there, he took me in the back to so I could take pictures of some of the Brazilians that they have so I can demonstrate what a cephalium looks like on these mature cacti that I don't necessarily have. Cool excuse me, quite the age in my yard yet, but this is a cephalium and this is what I was telling you, it grows down one side of the plant. So this is where the flowering happens. And it's hairy and spining this area to protect the developing buds and the developing fruit before they're ready. Um, they are nocturnal. So this guy wasn't quite all the way open. It's the best I could do. Um, so I, I, I kind of pried it open a little bit so you can see the inside. To show you, it's, it's a nocturnal flower, so it's mostly white, doesn't have a whole lot of color. So you grow these for the body more than the flowers. Another genus you will see fairly regularly and also is endemic to Brazil. I don't know, they may get into Paraguay, um, but very cool. They do stay fairly small. They're very, um, they're usually very endemic to specific substrates like the quartz or sand or things like that. There's actually some that grow in Brazil in pure sand and they're almost covered up. Um, they do form a cephalium at the very middle of the plant. Um, unfortunately, mine were flowering, my pictures are flowers, so you couldn't really see the cephalium, but trust me, there's a little white tuft of hair in the middle where the flowers come from. They are nocturnal flowering. And if you do grow these, you know that you have to be very, very, very attentive because the flower buds will appear and flower within a day out of that cephalium. They grow extremely fast. 
out of that cephalium if you and they blow up flower for one day one night only so if you miss them you miss them um so i was lucky and caught this just cactus guanecari flowering uh, they also for me tended to flower during monsoon which was a problem because uh, we actually had a mute monsoon this year when my placenta formis flowered here as you can see the cephalium so this is a species that converts to completely growing cephalium instead of the photosynthetic tissue. And so this plant will never grow anymore. The cephalium is the only thing that's gonna grow, not the green, um, but that's where the flowers come out of. And I've got pelted with rain that night and I ran out there while it's coming down like the Dickens to try to get my one picture of my placenta form is flowering. I know I said Brazilian cacti to grow in Arizona, but I have to mention Dickia. Uh, the genus Dickia is a genus that's extremely diverse in Brazil. Um, they're a bromeliad, they're bromeliaceae, so they're related to uh, pineapples. Um, but you may be familiar, more familiar with the Central American Hectias, um, the, the Peru of uh, the Andean genus Puya, and other types of bromeliads. But Dickias are almost completely found in Brazil. They get slightly farther out of Brazil, like in Paraguay and stuff. But they're gorgeous um, group of plants that you can grow that give you that different shape in your garden and yet you can still maintain the Brazilian integrity, right? Um, they all have these beautiful um, orange, yellow, uh, red sometimes and white flowers on the flowering stalks. And they do not die after they flower, they get another um, growing point and continue to live on. So back to cacti, a very unique uh, genus of cactus is actually a genus that there's only one species. So Leganosocerius luetzelbergii. Um, it was formerly lumped into another genus. I'm not going to talk about that because that was ridiculous. Um, but these have a, a very interesting place amongst cacti that are growing cephalia because it doesn't quite have a cephalium. It's kind of a picture into the past of what these cacti may have looked like early on when they started evolving cephalia. Because this guy, um, this is a plant, this is not my plant, my plant um, are too small, um, but so I want to show you mature plants. So this is also Michael Palais of Prickly Prospects. This is his plant that he had flowering this year. So he sent me some photos. Thank you, Michael. Um, but I do have seedlings. Anyhow, they grow sort of like an Echinopsis washa, like a, um, um, I can't remember now the name of the, the English name of them, but those Echinopsis that grow in, in thinner columns, um, so they'll grow, and this is, ignore this, this was a, a year when it didn't have any light, right? And then it reformed, it started growing normal again. Uh, this was some damage from a winter, but then it was growing normal again. But you'll notice here, it started narrowing again, and the aerials started getting a lot closer together. Well, this is because it got mature. This is actually when it hit maturity, and it's a cactus that is starting to evolve a cephalic-like tissue. So it's already figured out, it's like, oh, I'm mature enough that I can live without growing bigger. So I'm going to start concentrating on flowering, right? And so it says, I don't need to produce as much photosynthetic tissue. I can concentrate on growing the aerials and the flowering. And so it starts to narrow. And, and, and so it doesn't have as wide of a, a branch. So it looks like it's deteriorating. But it's not. It's actually, that's the flowering zone up here. And sure enough, the flowers come right out of the flowering zone. They get a little spinage here, a little hair around the flowers to kind of protect them as they're coming out. Um, so in habitat, they'll look like wine bottles. And sure enough, they do often refer to them as wine bottle cacti. So they're thick at the base, but when they hit maturity, they just start narrowing naturally. And that's the, what they call a protocephalia or before cephalia. Really cool species, love growing it here and they do really well too. And then this is a genus that probably everybody's seen before. I include it here in the Brazilian cacti because Melocactus reaches its highest diversity in Brazil. A lot of different populations, some of named species, subspecies, varieties, taxonomies, pretty much a mess, but there's lots and lots and lots of them, many more than you will find in other parts of their range. They are found all the way to uh, Central Mexico. There's some species in Central Mexico. Uh, most of the Central American ones are considered the same species. There are several species within the West Indies, both of them are greater and lesser Antilles. 
And then there are also some that go down the spine of the Andes all the way to central southern Peru. Um, but they really do reach their peak diversity in Brazil. And Mila cactus are a classic cephalium growing cactus. Uh, they grow their photosynthetic tissue, uh, the green part, until it's mature. And just like disco cactus, which they're actually very, very closely related molecularly to disco cactus, those white flowering ones uh, that flower at night, um, they'll get, they'll convert completely to cephalic tissue. So these are just one aerial stacked on top of another. Hundreds and hundreds of aerials are, are stacked on top of each other here. And they don't have any chlorophyll because it relies upon the other parts of the plant to actual photosynthesize. They're just concerned with reproduction. And the buds hide inside the hair of this cephalium until they're completely ready. You barely see it until like on this one, this is Melocactus concinus in my garden. I'll see it, um, this is the type of bud you'll see the day before the flower appears. And then the flower itself pops up and opens only in the afternoon. And some days it'll, there'll be one, sometimes there'll be none. And this day, this was the maximum number I've had. So I had five at, at one time. Um, so it will never actually grow any bigger as a plant, but many of the species of Melocactus will continue to produce tissue in their cephalium. And it gets so dense that the cephalium starts getting tall. It'll grow up. It'll grow up like a cylinder. And the, the cephalium will actually often be taller than the cactus itself. And so you can, you can do some online looking. Mine aren't that old because they have to start getting pretty old by that time. But you'll see some in nurseries and you can see some, if you Google Milo cactus on the internet, you'll see this part is really tall on some older individuals and it will continue to produce flowers from that area only. Uh, and this guy, to show you how fast a cephalium does form when it matures, I didn't even know this had a cephalium in January of this year. I started thinking, ooh, I think it might be starting to form a cephalium in February of this year. And already it's producing flowers like this. So it happens very rapidly once they get to a mature size. And there's some that start a lot smaller and get to maturity of small sizes and some of them that actually do wait for quite a while until they actually start to form a cephalium. Micranthosaurus is another genus that you will occasionally see available that does really well in Arizona. There's quite a, there, there's probably like eight or nine species. Um, and I do grow most of them. There's only a couple of them that I don't grow right now. Um, this is Flaviflorus. It's the most common one. And when you first look at these, they tend to grow uh, the flowers towards the tip and they kind of go down the side a little bit. And you can see that fuzzy hair in there. So a lot of people think that this is a cephalium. It is not. It actually, the aerials do have photosynthetic tissue, so they're not a true cephalium. So what we call that is we call that a flowering zone. And in the flowering zone, you typically have the hair uh, produced on some species to protect the flowering buds and the developing fruit as well. So this is one that some of the species in the genus do have a flowering zone. Others do have a true cephalium. You can see here on this guy, here's a, a flower that actually started to grow on the side of the plant. So it shows you that it, it's not forming a true cephalium. Micranthosaurus polyanthus is another one that uh, forms a flowering zone. You can see underneath the fur the colors of the tissue. So that tells you it's still photosynthetic, so not a true cephalium. And uh, Micranthosaurus violet, violet florist is the last one I added to my collection, so I had to include it here because it's a really rare plant. I was very excited to get it, and it is really gorgeous. It's got beautiful uh, fur coming from the spines towards the tip. So I'm hoping a, uh, a cephalium or a flowering zone forms soon. It's got beautiful red spines coming out of it. And there are several other species that are available. Micranthosaurus purpureus used to be really, really rare in cultivation, but it's actually pretty regular in Arizona now. B&B um, &B cactus, is, cactus farm in Tucson especially, got a pretty good shipment of them a couple of years back. And so quite a few people are growing them now. I was at b, b a couple of months ago. They still have them there. So beautiful cactus. It does grow a true cephalium, and that's where the flowers come out of in Micranthosaurus purpureus. Purpureus is purple, right? But it's not purple flowers. It's purple tepals. So it's named for the tepals, the outer part of the flower, not the inner part. These are nocturnal flowers, so the white is the tepals, uh, the petals on the, in the inside. But they do really great here. They can't stand full sun, at least in my experience, but they do really, really well here. 
very popular and I highly encourage anybody to grow that one. Strecheri does really well here. Mine has not flowered. It's probably pretty close to it, but a friend of mine in San Diego sent me a picture of his flowering to show you what the flowers are like. Most of these are pollinated. The day, day bloomers are pollinated by hummingbirds. The night bloomers are pollinated by moths and bats. One, uh, one genus that is actually very easy to come by in most um, nurseries is Parodia, also notocactus, depending on your taxonomy. I use Parodia, um, but there's numerous, numerous species. Almost all of them are found in Brazil, so that's why I include them here. Most of them do have a, a standard Parodia flower, which is that yellow with that uh, red or a colored um, um, stigmas. Um, there's Arnostiana and Arubescens here that are going in my yard, but the flowers do come in other colors. Here's Herderi, kind of a pink flower with a white center, and then Peninsulata, which is a completely red one. Spine, <clears throat> they, size wise, they can be quite large. Here's a Parodia schumaniana that's a size of a pretty good size barrel cactus. Um, and there's little tiny ones like my Parodia warneri that still flowers, and the, the color is amazing. It's metallic purple on these guys. And then they're often grown not only for their beautiful flower color, but for their spinage. So there's some with these hair-like spines, whereas other like this Zechariah are really fierce spines. Beautiful, beautiful plants, and they love growing here. Piabronia biensis. Um, if you're a member of the Facebook site for the club, you've seen me post these before. It's a favorite of mine. It is a very unique uh, genus, only found in Brazil. There's only three species currently. Um, this one is rarely but regularly available. Occasionally, box tends, uh, tends to have them every now and then. Um, I've had mine for years. I grew it from a little seedling. And um, they don't have a cephalium, but they do flower usually at the newest aerials, so at the tips like this one. But you'll see sometimes they'll flower from older aerials, like on the side there. So Pierabrani is a very unique genus. Some people lump it with those Arohodoas that do the cephalic rings. I'm not convinced of that. The flowers do seem very, very similar, but there's other things to consider. Pelosocerius is another widely um, grown genus. Um, the genus is actually found all the way from uh, Mexico, Central Mexico, and the West Indies all the way through South America. And it does reach a very, very broad diversity within Brazil. So there's a number of species in Brazil, but you will find them outside of Brazil. Some form cephalia, uh, some form flowering zone. So here's uh, a chrysostele which these are flowering zones. They're not flat, they're not cephalia. Um, mine tried to flower for the first time ever last year, but in the middle of our 120 degree heat and it, it ended up aborting. I don't blame it, I would have aborted if I could too. Um, but just to give you an idea, this is the same plant. These two pictures are the same plant. I planted this guy when he was four inches tall. I got him from Home Depot in one of those little two inch round pots, stuck him in the ground, and 10 years later, I have this gorgeous uh, Pylosocerus crisis deal. Of course, that's not the name that was on the pot. So you kind of have to know what you're looking for um, because they're typically have misidentified. But if you know what you're looking for, you'd find some real goodies. Here's an example of some other Brazilian Pylosocerus that you can find regularly. This was also this uh, Pylosocerus gunelli zentneri. It was also a Home Depot um, purchase. This is one of the most common ones that you can find um, in nurseries, box stores. Um, and for the geeks out there like me, it's recently, along with uh, related species, um, Fruenii, been put in its own genus. The Jique Jique is the genus. That's the Portuguese name for those plants. Um, and their Fruenii and Gunelli are now in Jique Jique instead of Pilosocerius. Um, but you also, Pilosocerius pachycletus, Azurius, the same thing. Um, hugely variable species, but everybody grows it because of the blue body. Very, very common in, in cultivation. You'll see those all over the place. And they do actually survive in full sun. Um, Macrissii is another one, a green one, so not nearly as popular. One of my favorites, um, and if you want to grow a Pelosocerius and see them flowering, I recommend Pelosocerius flexibilis spinus pahiensis. It flowers when it's only about a foot tall. And this plant that I have here had uh, blooming last year is exactly about a foot tall. Beautiful night blooming flowers. They're bat pollinated typically in Brazil. Um, but if you're looking for them, they're actually under a name that's not valid, but Pelosocerius calcisaxicola is what it usually is located under, um, but it's not a valid name. That's just the correct name. But you can find them um, at 
specialist nurseries, you know, the arid lands in the box and the B&Bs, those types of places. Cicobacatus is a genus that has been recently split from Micranthosarius. Um, they are uh, night bloomers, uh, but they do form cephalia, but they have to be pretty big before they get the cephalium. So my plants have not yet gotten cephalium. I think I have one Dolichospermaticus that is getting close. I'm crossing my fingers, um, but uh, not quite yet. So they're very handsome. Dolichospermaticus is a very, very hard to come by. Uh, pops up very, very rarely at places. Estevesia, you can find, you can usually find at Home Depot or, or other places completely misidentified. Here's one that came from B&B, for example. So they are definitely available and out there. Stephanosarius is a unique um, monotypic genus. So it's the only species in the genus. Actually, a lot of people think it's related to Arohodoa, which is that ring cephalic one, except it gets a lot larger. As you can tell, this is my block wall in my yard, right? So this is a pretty tall plant. I've got it staked up here because we've been windy a little bit lately, and I didn't want to take any chances with this guy because they tend to not flower until they're quite a bit older, uh, unlike Arohodoa. And I think, and that's why I've got this picture, I think mine is actually starting to flower for the first time ever this year. So I'm, I've got a, a plastic chair sitting right next to it. So I, I'm so short, I got to stand up on top of the chair to take pictures of the, uh, this area every day to see if I see some uh, bud coming in. So keep your fingers crossed for me. This would be spectacular. It is a night bloomer and it does get those cephalic rings and it will bloom only at those cephalic rings. Um, a lot of people look at this, they think these are cephalic rings, but they're not. These are growth rings. This is just how much it's grown during past seasons and it gets a little spiny um, for some reason. I don't know why at the end of each season, thinking, oh, maybe I'm going to flower or something. I don't know what's going on, but these are not cephalia. The, the, the cephalium is only when the flowers can actually appear, so keep your fingers crossed for me. For you, for you Apuntiad lovers, I'm not a big Apuntiad guy, but in Brazil, I can make uh, an exception because they have a really cool genus that's endemic to Brazil called Tasinga. Um, so Tasinga's uh, like our Pontia genus, um, most of the species are flat pads, like this in Amoena, and the sub subcylindrica, which is a little more elongated, but still in pads. Um, most of the, for the most part, they don't have the bad spines that a lot of our Pontias do, so I like them better that way. But we don't, <clears throat> Tasinga also has cylindrical um, growing uh, Tasinga, similar to like a Pontia chafii. Uh, grows in a, sl a cylindrically, is not in pads. Uh, it's a single funalis, and it's a beautiful green flower. And uh, full disclosure, my funalis has not yet flowered either, but I wanted to include it because it's just a cool flower. So this is a flower on um, the plant of Jorge Quinones in California, sent me this and graciously allowed me to use it in the slideshow. Um, so I can't wait until mine flower because that's a really cool uh, green flower, I'm partial to green flowers. Um, as you can see, sub cylindrica is tiny, this is the uh, regular old quarter compared to it's almost identical to an amoena. It's just a miniature version. They used to be thought to just be varieties of each other, but it's now shown to be uh, completely separate species. They found a place in Brazil where they're found growing together without hybridizing whatsoever, and they're completely separate. And those plants, uh, those tesingas, both of those I grew from seed. So uh, they do grow relatively fast from seed and get to a flowering size. size. So all in all, where, do, where can I get some of these guys? I know I've mentioned a couple of places already, um, a couple more Pila Cesareus, Pioensis, Parodia terrestriana, and Fashroa. Fashroa I didn't talk about, but it's another unique genus to Brazil. It's a columnar, closely related to uh, Pilosocereus. They get very tall. Um, some, uh, most of them do form cephalia, some don't. Um, interesting thing about Fashroa, one of the populations, some of them grow cephalia and some of them don't even within the same population. So some weird things going on there. But where can I get some of these? If you really wanna grow some um, in your yard or in your shade house, greenhouse, well, go to the CACSS meetings and you can find them there. I know that Brazilians have been there because I brought many of them to these meetings, whether they grow from seed or got them elsewhere. So they are there as well as the PEG meetings, the Propagation Education Group meetings. So I give a plug for us, May 29th, mark your calendars at the DBG eBay, as much as we hate doing anything on eBay, I have to admit that a lot of these rare things you can find from these individual growers just happen to have these things offered on eBay. Be careful, some of them don't know what they have. 
uh, and they might come ident misidentified, or you might get lucky and they think it's something common and you know it's something rare and you get it for a cheap price. That has happened. Prickly Prospects Nursery, I, I mentioned a couple of times, Michael Pillay is the, the owner of that nursery. It's a recent online nursery that um, he does online orders. He's located out in Tucson, and I specifically bring him up because he and I are working together on a project to propagate Brazilian cacti from a, a grower in um, Brazil that we're working with to propagate some of the rarest of the rare species that are under threat from habitat destruction or otherwise under the threat of extinction. So we're working with the Brazilians there and he and I are working to propagate these things for to get them out into cultivation. So hopefully within the coming years, you'll see more and more of these really unusual guys uh, pop up in um, uh, different areas and different nurseries around the country, specifically in Arizona. So keep an eye on that. Um, Huntington, as I mentioned, um, often will release some Brazilian species. Um, keep an eye on that. That's every year they announce a different set of species they're releasing. Um, I think in the next issue, and I talked to John Traeger last week, is when they're going to be announcing what is in for this year. So keep an eye on the ISI offerings. That's once per year, and they're published in the Cactus and Succulent Journal if you get it. Arizona Cactus Sales. I've actually gotten several of them here in Phoenix. Um, uh, from Arizona Cactus Sales, several of my Brazilians, some beautiful Milo cactus he had last year. I've got my Micranthosarius there, got some Parodias there, so he has always a great variety and often a good place to get some neat Brazilians. Arid Adaptations in Tucson, Jeff Moore's proprietor there. I'm sure most everybody knows about him. He's actually making a really great uh, um, effort to grow some of these Brazilians. He's a good source for things like Arthrocerus rondonianus that we talked about. That's such a really cool plant. Uh, I know he grows them really well uh, and he grows a lot of the fresh aroa. He grows there as well as some Arohadoa. So if you're looking for Brazilians, Jeff's a good place to go to as well. I mentioned Box is also a good source. Uh, they've got Don Vico there that grows a lot of Brazilian stuff. And so they often offer those things for sale. B&B, um, uh, Mark Sitter's um, nursery in Tucson is also a great source um, of Brazilian species. Often have to know what you're looking for there, um, but it is a, has been a great source for me in the past. And then of Airlands, they do offer some um, Brazilians that I know of right now, Parodias, um, Coleocephalocereus, Arius, that one I mentioned with the neon green flowers, I know they're selling that right now, so definitely a place to look at for Brazilians. And then, of course, I, I have to mention box stores because I've got some really rare things in box stores that they didn't know they were selling um, as really rare things. So if you know what you're looking for, study the books, because when they pop up in these places, you can get some really great deals. Um, the other way is to grow them from seed. I know a lot of people think it takes a long time to grow these from seed. It really doesn't take that long to get them to, if not a, a flowering size, then a really attractive size. I mean, I know some of these columnars. I will never live to see them bloom, but they just are really attractive when they're small too. So I just really enjoy every aspect of growing them from seed. And in many cases, most cases, a lot of these rare things are only available from seed currently. Um, you can get those from uh, like Succulenta releases a list every year in the Netherlands. Um, just make sure you're getting the seeds legally. So I had to mention, how can I help the plight of the Brazilian species? If you want more um, information about uh, conserving uh, plants and animals in, in Brazil, please uh, contact or, or go online to the Nature Conservancy in Brazil, uh, the work that they're doing there, as well as the USAID Bilateral Biodiversity Conservation Group um, in Brazil is also doing some great work. So I really highly recommend uh, contacting or uh, looking up those two organizations. And then how can I help? Well, I can propagate these Brazilian species. It lessens the um, the impact to them in the wild. Um, it's not as bad as it, in Mexico where we have a lot of poaching happening for collection purposes, but it does happen in Brazil as well. So the more we propagate internally um, in, in, in cultivation, the less pressure there's going to be on these plants in, in the wild. Encourage others to grow them as well. Ensure your plants and seeds that you obtain are legally obtained. It is not hard to get import permits. Um, if you need help getting them, I can tell you how to get them. Um, and you can do everything above board. It's not that much difficult. So grow your own. That's the best way to do it. Grow your own, enjoy them. You'll, you won't regret it at all. Um, I've started growing it from seed because we're growing a lot of these with the project I mentioned with um, 
uh, Michael Pillay with the Brazilians, but here's just some of the species that you just simply cannot find in cultivation that I'm growing right now. In these pictures are pictured four different species of Coleocephalocerius, Cepocerius pleurocarpus, Microanthocerius violesiflorus, Neocerius, another endemic genus to Brazil. It's just on and on, all these different things. Here's some that we grew from seed that are already a good size of things that are virtually unknown in cultivation. Arthur series millinaris in Brajaya, Estevesii in Brajaya is a, a genus that was only discovered and described about 10 years ago, maybe not even that long ago. Um, it's the only species in the genus and it's, um, we, we're starting to grow those now too. Um, Estevesii is another monotypic genus just discovered and described like six years ago. Um, formerly thought to be extinct in the wild, but it has been found in the wild again. And we were able to get some seed from our, our contact who's growing them in cultivation in Brazil. And we are now growing those in the US too. So uh, keep on with the seed growing. It's not as difficult as you can think and it does a lot of good in the long run. So with that, as the Brazilians would say, muito obrigado, or muito obrigada for the, the ladies in the audience. Um, but from there, I don't know, do you want me, I can take questions or however you want to work it. Yes, anybody can, um, I think the easiest way is to type in a question, which there's one right now. Are plants self-fertile? Are plants self-fertile? Some are and some aren't. Unfortunately, that's the answer. Um, I. I have found in my um, propagation experience in the past several years that some plants that are thought to be non-self-fertile, in other words, they can't pollinate themselves, will occasionally produce seeds, and sometimes those seeds are actually fertile. They tend to be not very vigorous in my experience when they're self-fertilized uh, as compared to when they're outcrossed, but sometimes they actually do produce Oh. A, a random, which is which is understandable because that's how it evolved and that's how things continue to um, uh, be available self-fertilization wise in the plant um, uh, plant order as a whole. Do you see the other question? Can can you suggest a growing guide from seed? Uh, from seed, absolutely. Go to the Central Arizona Cactus and Succulent Society's uh, website, centralarizonacactus.org, I believe. And on the, I think it's the information page or the documentation page, there's a whole section on propagation. And there are several articles written by uh, people in the club that are excellent guides. Uh, Leo Martin's written uh, one for how to grow from seed, Doug Dawson. Um, Ken Luton put a, a recent one together. Um, so there's several different uh, methodologies. Um, basically, there are many ways to grow seeds as there are seeds on the planet. So everybody has their own um, go-to method uh, that differs either a lot or a little from the next guy. But um, just take some experimentation. But, you know, I started growing from seed in, in 2013, and I still have plants that I grew from that very first time uh, that I sowed from seed. So you can be successful very, very early on. For those of you last year that participated in the PEG Challenge, I've seen several people that have never grown from seed before and just took a Dixie cup and started growing them in the, in the Dixie cups following the instructions and have started to grow some really nice cacti already after a year. So it's, it's not as difficult as a lot of people think. I have right behind me back here, you'll see the lights. That's my setup right there. There's a shelf and I can grow up to 78 species um, in that <laughs> setup right there behind me. So Very nice. I, grow, I grow year round. So that's why I like growing in, in under lights inside. I can start them in the winter. By the time they're big enough to go outside, it's warm enough for me to move them outside. There's another question. Do you see that one? No, I bet I, I can't pull up the chat. It won't oh. pull up the chat for some okay. reason. Oh, it was, where'd it go? Maybe Is granite options? mixed with native soil or other amendments? Uh, I, I usually purchase my cactus mix at uh, Arizona Cactus Sales, so I don't know what the brand is um, that they have there, but it's whatever brand that they, brand that they have. I get it from him, and I get a bag of pumice from, uh, from Arizona Cactus Sales, mix those together, and then for my Brazilians, I just go to the Home Depot and buy a bag of granite um, rocks, you know, like your, your top cover, top dressing type stuff, uh, decent sized ones, maybe like a half inch to a three quarter inch type size and throw them all in a wheelbarrow, 
mix them all together. And um, that's what I use for planting a lot of these Brazilians. There's another question. Uh, do any of the cactus go dormant in the heat of the summer? If so, do you stop watering them? Um, that's a really tough question because for the most part, cacti, when it, get, when it doesn't get below 85 or so degrees, uh, plus or minus five or six degrees, uh, for any cactus, it is extremely hard for them to breathe. Uh, they just can't breathe because it doesn't get cool enough at night for the stomata, the holes that the gases pass through where they breathe. They, they just don't open all the way. And so a lot of cactus, they're, they're basically, they're suffocating. And so to survive, there's a, tends to be a natural reaction of plants to kind of save themselves to kind of go dormant, kind of not require anything and to kind of shut down for a while. So I can't say for sure that they don't do it, but Brazilians um, don't tend to do it as, as dramatically as Sonoran and our, our native desert plants would. I tend to still water them through the summer, especially since we haven't been getting monsoons. Uh, monsoons actually, you know, allows me to not water as much um, during the summer months when it gets really hot because not only will we get the water, but we'll get the, the cod cover. So that'll help too to, to uh, decrease the evaporation and the humidity helps as well. So um, it's, it's not a hard and set rule. I personally tend to water mine somewhat through the hottest months, but I try to be careful. It's not heavy watering at any one point in time, uh, but I do tend to water through the hottest months. Okay. This is going really deep. Oh. Comments. Comments. Um, anybody else have any questions? One's nope. question dormant. It looks like it's it. That's it. Well, thank you, Tristan. It was excellent presentation. Really nice. Very welcome. Very welcome. I want to remind everybody that the next meeting will be May 23rd at 2 o'clock at Dorrance Hall. And then May 29th will be the PEG meeting in Dorrance Hall also. And we'll be sending out all the specifics about the uh, details of the meetings. And I want to thank everybody for um, coming to the meeting. So thank you. Thanks, everybody. Hey, Craig, have you, did you uh, record this? It says it's recording. I did hit the, the button, yes. Okay, are we gonna, uh, does Tris give us permission to put it up on our YouTube channel? Oh, I thought you'd talk to him about, about it. Let's ask him now. I did not, I did, it's yeah. just the mind. Yeah, that's fine, don't worry you, about You're it. okay with that? Yep. Okay. Great, thank so you. If, when you get that rendering done, um, you can either just send me a link to like if you have it up on Google Drive or something like that. You won't be able to email it. It'll be too big. Okay. So actually, probably what I'll do is um, I, I think you.